Tell me, which road do you tend to take? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveller, long I stood, And looked down one as far as I could, To where it bent in the undergrowth. So, which road do you take? Sometimes the shortest route may not be the best. Maybe it has all kinds of dangers on it. And so is the case in tonight's story. Another story from Dr. Creepin's vault for you this evening. Well, my dear friends, it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Oh, come on, you're not serious. <laughs> what? I am. It's clearly the fastest way to get to our campsite. But, have you heard of the stories? The deaths? The thing that lives there? Ugh, just stories. Look, I have a friend who uses it every single week for his deliveries, and I just talked to him yesterday. But, I switched off the walkie-talkie. Ugh, there they go again. I sighed to Gabby, who was next to me. You can't blame them. Just trust me, Brian's just thick-headed. Anything anyone says, he dismisses. Just the only thing he trusts are his own thoughts. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. I just find it irritating, Gabby replied, gripping the wheel harder and glaring at the vehicle in front of her. Do you need me to switch it back on? I asked. No. Nah. I think that hearing plain silence is a million times better than hearing their incessant arguing. Yeah, but don't you think... Relax. We'll switch it on later. After all, we don't want the lead car to bring us to some deserted area rather than the campsite we're supposed to go to, right? Gabby turned her head to look at me briefly. <sighs> all right, I replied, and leaned back on the leather seat of the car and looked behind at the back seat. As usual, our camping bags, with all our supplies, still sat there on the back seat. Stop doing that. You're making me think someone's sitting behind us, Gabby complained. <laughs> Sorry, lady, I muttered, and turned my head to look in front again. Oh, just a few more hours, and we would reach the campsite where we would camp for the next few days. Ryan said he was going to catch a deer. He's probably going to come back with some nuts and berries again, and Gabby would rage at him, and he probably wouldn't listen to her again. Uh, well, might as well catch some sleep, I thought, as my eyes drooped down and I nodded off to complete silence. Wake up, sleepyhead! Gabby's voice pierced through my dream, and I sat up, still half asleep, realizing that we'd stopped. Through heavy eyelids, I could see Gabby, along with Brian and Becky, standing in front of some sign on the road. Groaning, I opened the car door and stepped out of the car. What's going on? I muttered sleepily. Brian rolled his eyes and remarked, Did you forget? Before you enter Whistler's Highway, you must sign the agreement. Stepping forward and looking closely at the sign, I remembered... <laughs> right, 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 I said hastily, as I took out my marker and signed on the surface of the sign. The sign wasn't the prettiest thing I saw on the highway. Danger, you're entering the Whistler's Highway. By signing on this sign, you agree to the rules of the highway. 1. Don't travel on the highway at night, otherwise the Whistler will get you. 2. Don't travel alone. Otherwise, the Whistler will get you. Three. Don't. Absolutely don't. Get out of your vehicle while on the highway. Otherwise, the Whistler will definitely get you. We're emblazoned in red on the sign, with a space at the bottom, where numerous signatures, including mine, Becky's, Gabby's, and Brian's, were marked on the surface with some crossed out for no particular reason. The entire sign looked like it was about to fall off, as it very carefully balanced on the post holding it up. Boy, 
This Whistler guy seems like a fun guy to meet. Half of me thought to myself, while the other half still felt a bit unsettled by the get you part. Becky also seemed to share my thoughts, as she stared upwards worriedly at the sky, which was visibly turning darker. Are you sure we're safe when we go down this highway? I mean, it's almost night time, and the sign clearly said... She stammered. <sighs> Don't worry. The Whistler is just an urban legend, and I doubt he would be mad if we broke one of his precious rules. Brian interrupted confidently. Looking at the three people around him, he remarked, oh, Come on, let's get a move on. I don't intend to sleep in the car. He'd already opened the car door, and was now waiting for us back in the car. The three of us sighed and moved towards our respective cars. The engine started up and began to trundle down the Whistler's Highway. Looking at the empty desert along the highway, couldn't shake the feeling that we had made a mistake and that we were in grave danger. Still feeling scared, I tilted my head and looked up at the sky. It was indeed getting dark. After staring at the desert and the sky for about an hour or so, I began to notice something strange. Notably, the dark black sky had turned purple. Now, I didn't know much about weather and sky colours and all that, but, but I knew that the sky shouldn't be purple at what was about 9pm, as my watch helpfully indicated. I tried to mention this to Gabby, but she looked noticeably distracted, and her foot was continuously pushing down on the gas pedal. It was then that I realised something else. The car was slowing down. Looking at the car in front of us, I saw that it was also slowing down. Fuck! I heard Gabby shout as she exerted all her strength into pushing the gas pedal, hoping that the car would suddenly go faster. But it was no use. Both of the cars eventually stopped after a few minutes. The engine wasn't dead, and the car was still running, but it wasn't moving. Well, Gabby said, throwing her arms up in defeat and turning to look at me. Someone's got to get out there and fix this damn car. Looking at her eyes, I knew she meant me. I sighed and prepared to open the car door. Wait! Becky's shrill voice pierced through the walkie-talkie. What? Gabby shouted in response, covering her ears as though she expected more loud noises. Remember the third rule? No getting out of the car while on the highway. Oh, for God's sake, Becky. You seriously bought into that sign? It looked like it was erected about a million years ago. Brian's angry shout echoed in the car. But uh, the Whistler. Yeah, but the Whistler nothing. It's just a stupid bogeyman story created to scare kids into saying nothing during road trips. There's nothing dangerous about stepping outside. Having had enough, I shot back a reply into the walkie-talkie. You know what, Brian? I'm going to listen to Becky, and I'm going to stay inside the car. You can go outside and get your annoying ass eaten by the Whistler, or whatever he's called. Next to me, Gabby opened her mouth, seemingly to protest, but she didn't say anything. All right, fine. But don't blame me if nothing happens and we end up wasting our time, Brian replied angrily. A few minutes of silence passed. Uh, all right, guys. To pass the time, let's play some car games. Silence. All right. Fine. What do you want to play first? Oh, let's play I Spy. I Spy with my little I. Something beginning with the letter D. Groaning, I replied. Desert. You're spying a desert. Correct. Now, Jordan, it's your turn. Sighing, I looked out the window, hoping to find something I could spy. And that's when I saw it. Far off in the distance, something was standing in the desert. I couldn't quite make out its features, 
but I knew for a fact that it was way taller than an actual human. It had a black top hat on, and it was wearing some kind of red suit. I couldn't see its eyes, but I knew it was looking in our direction. I could vaguely hear some kind of whistling noise coming from that thing. That whistling creature. The Whistler. What do you think it wants? Becky's frightened voice came out over the receiver. I don't know. Maybe it's an illusion? Brian's voice came out, also trembling. I couldn't say anything. I was just staring at the thing, transfixed. Okay, now we definitely should not get out of the car, Becky said. Okay, me, Gabby and Brian said in unison, as if that was not obvious. We all sat in our cars, staring at the whistler. It was whistling a tune. I couldn't quite make out much of the tune, but I knew I'd heard it before, either on the street or in a movie. But the whistling sounded unnatural. Hearing it sent chills down my spine and made me even more scared. The whistler didn't seem to move. He just stood in the same spot, whistling. He was waiting for us to get out of the car. Anxious, I began repeatedly checking the car lock, confirming that it was indeed locked, before I looked at Gabby. She looked paler than usual, and she didn't say anything. Well, anything to me at least. As I leaned in close, hoping to comfort her, I heard her mutter something under her breath. I need to get out. I need to get out. I need to get out need to get out of the car, of the car. I was genuinely freaked out then, and I shook her violently, hoping to snap her out of her chanting. She screamed and freaked out as soon as I shook her, before looking at me. D did I say anything? She said in a small voice. The four of us seemed to be even more on edge after I told Brian and Becky about Gabby's episode. We were scared to go to sleep, as we knew that if we did, we could risk ending up like Gabby. Gabby became incredibly frightened after I told her what she'd said, and she clutched my hand tightly. I clutched hers back equally tightly, and all of us just sat in silence for a few minutes. Eventually, I heard Gabby whisper, I'm hungry. I nodded to acknowledge this, and reached behind to grab the bag of supplies in the back seat. But, they weren't in the back seat. I looked around frantically for the bag, until I eventually saw it. For some unknown reason, it was on the road, outside the car. I rolled down the windows and tried to reach for it, but it was too far away. The only way to get it was to get out of the car. <laughs> this was its plan. It wanted us to get out of the car, so that it could do something to us. I rolled up the windows and glared at it. It seemed to notice that I wasn't going to get out of the car, because the whistling seemed to get louder. It was now very audible, and my ears began to ring from it. Despite this, I refused to get out. After a few minutes, the whistling grew quieter again, and once more we sat in silence. Gabby's stomach was growling now, but judging from her face, I knew that she didn't want to leave to get the bag. We sat in the car, while the walkie-talkie fell silent as well. It was playing a game with us, and we didn't know when it would end. Eventually, my eyelids began to droop again. Oh shit, not now. Must stay awake, I thought. But it was no use. I eventually drifted off to sleep again. Jordan! Hey, Jordan! It's over. The thing's gone. 
Brian's excited voice forced my eyelids to open. I looked around. Indeed, the whistler was gone. We'd arrived at the campsite. The bright rays from the sun shone into the car, forcing me to cover my eyes. I breathed a sigh of relief. That thing was finally gone. Come on, Jordan. Get your lazy ass out of the car. Brian was standing outside the car and was next to a pitched up tent. You need to help us set up camp. Next to him, Gabby and Becky were standing with sticks in their hands. Come on, Jordan, they remarked, smiling. All right, all right, I'm coming, I replied, as my hand gripped the car door handle as I prepared to open the door and step outside the car. Suddenly, a sharp pain erupted in the back of my head. As I reeled from the pain, I turned around to see who had hit me. Oh, please don't scare me like that, Gabby's frightened face whispered next to me. I was confused. Gabby was outside. Unless... I looked outside again. The campsite was gone. We were back again in the desert. The sky still had the strange purple hue to it. And that thing was still there. The whistling grew louder again. The whistler was clearly getting more frustrated now. I was even more scared now. I checked one more time to make sure the door was locked. Thank you, I turned to Gabby and whispered. She didn't reply, but she nodded in acknowledgement. We sat in silence again as the whistling grew softer once more. After a few minutes of silence, the car suddenly echoed with Becky's screams. Get them off me! Get them off me! Oh, help me! I hurriedly picked up the walkie-talkie and said, Hello? Brian? Becky? Can you hear me? It's all a dream. Don't panic. No response. The screams continued. This time I could also faintly hear crying coming from the receiver. It sounded as though Becky was in a lot of pain and desperately needed our help. But we couldn't do anything. We could only listen on, helplessly, to whatever pain Becky was going through. After a few minutes of screaming, it finally stopped. To our relief, the car doors on the car in front hadn't opened during the entire ordeal, so we heaved a sigh of relief. We knew that Becky had managed to overcome the nightmare she'd had, and didn't think of getting out of the car. The whistling grew way louder now, as the whistler began to walk closer to us. It looked taller now, and its arms and legs grew more elongated. He was clearly getting mad. I looked around the car, and looked at the car in front. All of us knew its tricks now. We weren't going to get tricked by... <gasps> I paused, as I remembered Brian. He hadn't been tricked by it yet, and he was the easiest person to trick, since he didn't trust anyone other than himself. Almost on cue, Brian's voice came through the walkie-talkie. Guys, the monster's gone. The coast is clear. <gasps> Woo! Looking at the whistler, who was coming even closer, I frantically shouted, No, it's a trick. Don't believe it. What are you talking about? What trick? The monster. It's still out there. Oh, Jordan, you must be imagining things. I don't see anything. No, it's still there. Listen, when I say it's not there, it's not there. To prove it, I'm going to step outside and show you. No, don't. But it was too late. The car door on the car in front opened and we watched as Brian's face emerged from the vehicle. It was over in an instant. As soon as Brian's foot stepped onto the concrete road, the whistler stopped whistling and lunged towards him at shockingly fast speed. As it reached him, 
I saw his expression change from one that was joyful and happy to one of pure terror. And then he was gone, along with it. The sky lightened, and the bright rays of the sun shone down upon us once more. We didn't say anything, even as the car started to move down the highway again. We looked at each other, and we knew one thing. The Whistler was real, and it had gotten Brian. A few weeks have passed since Brian's disappearance. As of today, the police are still unable to find his body anywhere, even after interviewing us, since... We were the last ones to have seen him. All we said was that he disappeared during our camping trip, and we haven't seen him since. We didn't say anything about the Whistler, because we knew that they didn't think the Whistler was real, and we didn't want to seem crazy. Sometimes, I'd like to think we all went crazy during the trip, and that there was no such thing as a Whistler, and that we just imagined the whole thing. But... I don't think that that's the case. Because when I go down to the Whistler Highway entrance sign, to place my flowers as a way to remember Brian, I can still see his signature on the sign. But it's been crossed out. What did you think of that one? If they'd only followed the rules, they would have been safe. <laughs> Not always as easy as it seems, is it? Well, my dear friends, that's it from me for this evening. But of course, I will be back again with you very, very soon. And I just know you're waiting to join me, aren't you? Yes, you are. Well, that most certainly is it for this evening. But I still have time to wish you sweet dreams and to say bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>